This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, I have been working in the field of women's mental health for about 15 years. When I came back out here to finish my residency, uh, I worked with Dr. Regina Casper to start the Women's Wellness Clinic. And so the Women's Wellness Clinic has been in existence since about 1992. And so one of the goals tonight is to review what we've learned in the last 15 years about mood disorders in women. And I think because I've been in the field for a long time, I do have a historical perspective. Um, so just to remind you all that women are much greater risk of having a mood disorder than men. Um, and this risk increases at the time of puberty and early adolescence, around 14, 15, and stays elevated throughout the reproductive years, um, about two times the rate as men. Uh, major depression is approximately twice as common, and as I said, it usually begins in the early adolescence. Um, the lifetime risk for a woman to have a major depressive episode is between 10 to 25% and the point prevalence, so at any particular point in time, 5 to, 10, 5 to 12 percent of men will be experiencing a major depression, um, excuse me, 2 to 3 percent, but women 5 to 9 percent. So you can see we have a significantly greater risk than men. I just wanted to review for folks, I think this is probably something most people are aware of, um, the difference between feeling blue and actually suffering from clinical depression. We define in psychiatry major depression as the experience for over two weeks of a loss of interest in activities and depressed mood. And then five out of nine symptoms that we call our vegetative symptoms. And um, the way we teach the medical students, the, the mnemonic for this is SIGI caps, the doctor has ordered. So sleep disturbance, decreased interest, guilty ruminations, change in energy, decreased energy, concentration and memory problems, appetite disturbance, and then what we call psychomotor retardation, so very slowed down bodily movements, or agitation. People can't sit still, they're fidgeting with their hair, as well as changes in sexual interest, and then suicidality. So if a person comes to us and says they're feeling depressed, that's, that is what we're trying to figure out. Is this an adjustment disorder in which we would not expect these five out of nine symptoms? or is this actually major depression which requires a, a form of treatment that we'll talk about. So one of the things that's, that's interesting and important is to understand that women have a different presentation than men frequently in depression. Um, for folks that are interested in the history of psychiatry, the earlier descriptions of depression, major depression, were what we call a melancholic depression. People would wake up in the morning feeling very down. They would have uh, significant insomnia and weight loss. Well, in fact, women frequently suffer from what we call atypical depression. So there's excessive sleeping and excessive appetite with significant weight gain. Furthermore, women often suffer from a seasonal pattern. You've all heard of seasonal affective disorder. And so what studies have found is that women frequently will have a recurrence of their depression in the, in the fall and this will occur more frequently in women than in men. Furthermore, um, women frequently suffer from what we call somatic symptoms, so painful physical sensations. And I don't know if many of you have seen these recent ads for uh, antidepressants that um, one of them is depression hurts. I don't know if anyone's seen that ad. Um, because we're realizing that that is a prominent part of depression for some people and the uh, antidepressants that have mixed norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake, like duloxetine, Cymbalta, or venlafaxine, Effexor, can be very helpful for the painful sensations involved in depression, as well as the cognitive and emotional symptoms. And women seem to suffer these more than men. Um, Uh-oh, is this out of order? I'm sorry. Well. In terms, we'll go back to that, of, of how, how has this come to be? Um, specifically, as you can imagine, there are um, many elements that are involved in the onset of major depression that would be uh, <coughs> similar in both men and women, and then some that would be unique in women. 
And for men and women, um, a past psychiatric history is a, is a strong predictor for a future depressive episode, as well as developmental factors. Both men and women, um, if they've had an early loss in childhood, loss of a parent, for instance, will have a greater risk later in life for the onset of major depression. Um, for women, though, we, we have a different uh, physiology than men. And as time has gone on now in women's health research, we've been learning that the reproductive hormones may play a role in the uh, larger risk for depression that we have. Um, and that's beyond the scope of the talk tonight. But we do know that um, estrogen and progesterone are associated with uh, the uh, regulation of neurotransmitters and the creation of receptors that are involved in mood and affect in people, um, specifically serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And it, what's, I think you'll really take home from our talk tonight is that individuals have individual sensitivities to the change in these hormones. Um, furthermore, psychosocial factors clearly are involved in the onset and uh, recurrence of psychiatric disorders in women and men. But what about these psychosocial and developmental factors? Well, women do suffer from sexual abuse um, at a higher rate than men, about two to four times in most studies. And that has been shown to be associated with the onset of major depression in later life. Um, furthermore, interesting research has come out that, um, just as you saw from the graph, that the rate of depression increases at puberty. Um, women who have early puberty appear to be at higher risk for the onset of depression, um, especially if this early puberty and bodily change is associated with negative emotions and feelings about one's body. Um, then I think one of the most fascinating um, aspects of uh, the difference in men and women and the psychology of depression is work by Susan Nolan Hoeksema, who was a graduate student and then an assistant professor here, um, she was leaving when I was coming, and um, she wrote a, a series of very interesting um, papers and then uh, did a very interesting book, if any of you are interested, Sex Differences in Depression, in which she was looking at how do men and women think, and could this be one of the roots of depression. And she did some studies that were done right here in the psychology building, in which she looked at attribution um, of, of uh, responses to test taking. So she gave both men and women tests that were um, not able to be solved and then looked at the emotional response and found that women were very depressed about it in comparison to men and furthermore looked at rumination and found that women would, would think about it um, whereas men would try to distract themselves. And so this, this came upon this concept of, of an active distracting style versus a ruminating style. And it, this really is important because it forms the, the cornerstone of a very particular psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy that some of you all may be familiar with, where we look at the thought processes that a person suffering depression is experiencing, and then we try to work very actively on changing those thought processes. And um, so that is in the field one of the thoughts of why there may be higher uh, rates of depression in women. And then finally, um, the concept of disappointing social roles and expectations. Luckily, this is improving for women, but that's been conceptually one of the thought processes of why we may be uh, suffering at higher rates than men. So just to review for you, um, and what I want to talk about today is, is the, the point is the um, sort of female-specific mood disorders. Um, and so what would we call those? Well. Uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, unique to women, perinatal depression, perimenopausal depression, and then mood disorders associated with infertility treatment. And specifically, these are the areas of clinical concern for the Women's Wellness Clinic. Um, as uh, I think it's important to point out, I'm mainly a clinician. I've been working in the clinic for 15 years, teaching residents. And this is the majority of the um, complaints that we see in the clinic and that we, we try to help with. Um, so, I thought I'd start with humor, a household tip, never try to load the dishwasher with PMS. <laughs> and um, I'll come back to why I really love that slide in a second. Um, wanted to frame 
menstruation historically because I think it has uh, an import for the evolution of the uh, treatment of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Just the concept that the luteal phase, the time before we um, get our period and, and the period itself is something to uh, be uh, repulsed by or to think of negatively. So um, in the first century AD, Pliny spoke of the, the actual toxicity of menstrual blood. And um, I, I love, on the approach of woman in the state, milk will become sour, seeds which are touched by her will become sterile, and grafts will wither away. And um, what's really fascinating is that in 1923, this concept was still alive. So I, I dug out this from, it's the New England Journal of Medicine in the stacks at Lane Library. I'd seen a reference and I just said, I've got to see this paper. And um, basically, it was by a researcher in Boston who basically took Pliny's idea and said that there is something toxic about this menstrual blood. And um, as you'll see, he did these um, important experiments with flowers in which he um, had the, the, the tea roses and they were exactly of the same freshness. And um, he then had a normal individual touch the flowers and then he had a woman who was menstruating who was abnormal touch the flowers. And you can see that the, that abnormal person um, led to this terrible wilting and dying of the flowers. And um, well, yeah, and, and the reason I also put this in is, I mean, th what's wrong with the experiment? <laughs> it's clearly not placebo controlled at all. And um, so that's been one of the, the fundamental aspects of trying to do research clearly in women's health is that we do good studies and that we get data that is uh, valid. So um, I put this in because uh, this is from 1931. It's the first uh, def definition of premenstrual dysphoric disorder in, in the American psychiatric um, lexicon. And it's by Robert Frank. And what's important is, is it's really alive today. It is almost the exact, as I'll show you, DSM-4, Diagnostic Statistical Manual definition of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, so as time went on, premenstrual tension um, became um, eventually late luteal phase dysphoric disorder. The luteal phase is the um, time after uh, the follicular rupture and ovulation. We call that the luteal phase, just to remind you. And then now it is called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. But there were different theories of what caused it from estrogen excess to progesterone. So just to show you how much this looks like Frank's concept of indescribable tension, basically in most menstrual cycles during the past year, more than five of the following symptoms had to be present during the luteal phase and remit within a few days on of the onset of the menses. Um, and what's pertinent is that one of the symptoms must be a mood symptom. It cannot just be physical symptoms. It has to be a mood symptom. And um, this mood, I'm sorry, marked liability. That's, that, that was Freudian. <laughs> it's supposed to be liability. <laughs> but unfortunately, the liability does lead to liability. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting. Um, and then marked anger and irritability. So um, what you'll notice is how similar these other symptoms, besides the mood symptoms, are to what we call the vegetative symptoms of major depression. So sleep disturbance, concentration disturbance, change in energy, um, hypersomnia, and physical symptoms then would be different. Um, Many people say that, that premenstrual dysphoric disorder is like having a mini depression right before um, your period every single month. Um, what's important is what Frank noted in 1931, that the disturbance needs to be of sufficient severity to lead to a disturbance in functioning. And that is what we um, classify premenstrual dysphoric disorder as, whereas PMS would be having a range of symptoms but not having a dysfunction in one's life. So the disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, occurs in 3 to 5% of women, whereas premenstrual symptoms 
are believed to occur in about 60% of women. Um, there's been many different definitions of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. Um, the way that the definition comes to be and the, the diagnosis is by looking at symptoms across the month. And so what I'm going to show you here is this is the um, is a daily rating form. And these were developed by the National Institute of Health in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s and didn't really come into clear clinical practice till the late 80s and early 90s when I started working in women's health. And what they, what, this is one page of a form that has about 20 symptoms. We don't use this form in the Women's Wellness Clinic. We use um, a shorter form. Um, but the point of my story is, is that women rate themselves daily. And um, what you would expect in premenstrual dysphoric disorder is to see this, I'm sorry with the light here, OK, to see this straight, non-symptomatic, what we call follicular phase. So basically, she was menstruating here, and then she was not menstruating, and now all of a sudden, she's about to menstruate. You see that? And so you would expect to see this pattern in comparison to this person who had symptoms very mild at different days of the month. And so the point of my story is, is that the medical field has tried to come up with a consensus of how do we define premenstrual dysphoric disorder. The NIH um, had said that there needed to be a 30% change in at least three symptoms between the follicular and luteal phase. Different um, clinical trials have different definitions. Um, in the women's wellness clinic, we tend to use that one. And of course, that also has to include a affective symptom of mood, of mood problems. Um, I also put in this page because, to remind you of the dishwasher um, slide, um, in the United States, the most common symptom of premenstrual dysphoric disorder is irritability. And um, I think that that dishwasher slide really has that sense there that the woman has just thrown it in and just given up by the end. Um, and that's, what, that's really one of the reasons that people call is because, as you can imagine, it's an interpersonal problem, isn't it, if you're irritable? And so we were one of the sites um, that did the multicenter sertraline, which is Zoloft, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, study, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the point of my story is the people that called were frequently friends, parents, significant others, not the woman herself, um, because they were responding to the premenstrual dysphoric symptoms. So just to remind you of the menstrual cycle, um, the important point here is that it is at um, the mid-cycle, around 14 days for the average woman that there's the rise in the LH and the FSH, which leads to the rupture of the follicle. And at that time, the estrogen level has also risen. And then the estrogen level rises again with the maturing follicle um, and the corpus luteum with the progesterone in the luteal phase. So you have these two rises. And what's interesting, um, the slide I showed you before in terms of theories, was that people thought that it was this um, change here that was causing the uh, onset and um, persistence of symptoms. And so for many, many years, including when I was in medical school, people were treating premenstrual dysphoric disorder with um, either estrogen or progesterone. But as the menstrual toxin um, study showed, it w those were often not placebo-controlled studies, just like the one in 21. And what we found was that really was not a form of, 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 of effective treatment for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And why would that be? Because um, consistently across studies, there's been not found, there's, there has been no difference found between women um, with premenstrual dysphoric disorder and women without in their levels of hormones. So that was the thought, and that's where they gave hormones, and that has now been shown not to be true. Um, what we do find is that it seems that some people are individually sensitive to changing hormone levels. And that is the group that may be suffering from the premenstrual dysphoric disorders, as well as other reproductive cycle-related disorders. Um, 
What's also interesting is, is that people with premenstrual dysphoric disorder appear to be more sensitive to um, hormone preparations. So in studies where people were given birth control pills, which you would expect to get rid of premenstrual dysphoric disorder because it's the menstrual cycle itself that is causing this dysregulation, um, many of those women would actually feel worse. Um, so what do we think is going on? I don't know how many people here have heard about the way we now treat it with this what we call luteal phase dosing. Okay, it's just this amazing mystery, has been an amazing mystery in psychiatry. Specifically, um, in about 94, um, when people were giving Prozac, as you remember it came out in like 90, um, women with premenstrual dysphoric disorder were saying, oh my goodness, I feel so much better. And some of the women that were being treated for depression actually probably had premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So they then decided to go forward and do some very good placebo-controlled studies of Prozac in this population. And what they found over time was that women would say, you know what, I actually didn't take my Prozac all month. I only took it for two weeks of the month because I don't really like taking it. And over time, they, they found that there could be efficacy in the treatment of premenstrual dysphoric disorder with just two weeks. But then people said, well, so what? Prozac is, has this long half-life and has a, also a metabolite that hangs around for two weeks later. So really, they're actually still treating themselves. So then they went on and, and looked at the treatment of premenstrual dysphoric disorder with, with medications such as sertraline that do not have this, ha this um, metabolite that hangs around. So once you stop sertraline, it really is out of your bloodstream and out of your body in about three to four days. And that group of women also said, I can do this. I, I feel better in three to four days on this medication during the last week of the month. And that's the study that we participated in the Women's Wellness Clinic. Specifically, it was a study of sertraline. It's a placebo-controlled study of sertraline all month, sertraline just during the luteal phase, and then this incredibly revolutionary idea of plus of um, PRN, which really was not PRN, it was onset of symptom dosing. And what they found was all three worked. And why could this be? Because as many of you probably know, the onset of antidepressant action is not within a few days. It's, it's usually a month because it has to do with receptor changes. Um, so what, they, what we're beginning to understand through animal models is that Premenstrual dysphoric disorder appears to be associated with progesterone and the, the breakdown of progesterone. So progesterone is metabolized into allopregnanolone and pregnanolone, and those are what we call neurosteroids, and they actually have central nervous system effects, and they actually have rather sedative-like effects, and they work upon the gabinergic nervous system the way benzodiazepines do, in a sense. And so the thought is, is that women with premenstrual dysphoric disorder have an abnormal um, breakdown here, and they make less allopregnanolone. And the thought is, in animal models, that the SSRIs are working upon the enzyme that um, converts pregnanolone to allopregnanolone. Now, this is a couple years from now going to be finalized, but this is the ongoing current theory of premenstrual dysphoric disorder and why the SSRIs work in such quick time. So um, I've just explained this, that the onset of action is so much shorter. Um, this is an ovary compressor. And it was used at the South PTA with Charcot in the end of the 1800s. And it, it's really kind of horrific. Um, they put it on the poor hysteric, hysterics, which were probably people with epilepsy. And tightened it because the thought was that if you could get the ovaries to calm down, people would stop having these hysterical behaviors. And um, what's interesting is, is that we do know that ovulation suppression can help premenstrual support disorder. So obviously that was a barbaric and completely non-functional method. But um, we have shown in multiple studies that birth control pills, especially Yasmin, are very helpful for 
premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And I really want to emphasize Yasmin, and I have no ties to any drugs in, of any form. <laughs> I'm a clinician. But um, it's a unique birth control pill. Have people here heard about Yasmin? It has a different progesterone derivative. It's not the same as the other birth control pills. It's got drosperinone in it, which is sort of like a particular um, hormone in our body called aldosterone, which is associated with fluid um, loss instead of fluid retention. And there's something about that that is, is, it seems to affect people in a more positive way. Um, so there's been two well-done studies of the use of Yasmin in premenstrual dysphoric disorder that have shown good efficacy. So um, the bottom line is, why, when would you use medication? If somebody fails to respond to lifestyle modica modification, which is, use, is very useful in premenstrual dysphoric disorder, exercise is very useful, relaxation training. One of the things that happened in the study that we participated in was women had to rate themselves for two months using the form that I showed you. And then if they really clearly had premenstrual dysphoric disorder, they would be invited into the study. But the problem is, is that some of them would go on vacation. And then, this, then they, could, they, wouldn't, they would take their forms with them and they would not fulfill criteria because their premenstrual symptoms would be so much better. And this is such a well-documented piece of premenstrual dysphoric disorder that stress makes it worse that they had to get, um, we had to get clearance from um, the central committee and it was going on at all the centers. So we ended up letting people rate again once they came back from vacation. We would not include that. So what I'm getting at is, is you remember in the definition, it's most months. It's not that every single month of the 12 months of the year, because it is affected by stress. Um, and what I say here is that, that um, it's important that the person not um, have a current diagnosis of bipolar disorder to be put on an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer, because that can be very um, concerning. Um, people who have bipolar disorder that are given an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer have a risk of um, <coughs> what we call switching and going from depression into hypomania or mania or having a, a, a acceleration of cycle frequency. So that is one of the key um, differential diagnoses that we must make in women's wellness clinic. And, um, I think that's one of the important aspects of coming to see a psychiatrist if you have a concern about it or a family member or a friend does because if, you, if a person has a family history of bipolar disorder, a GP often doesn't have the time to spend or really as much of the um, expertise to really tease out subtle clues to bipolar disorder in families. And this is actually um, not just a theoretical concern. We have seen uh, frequently people who have come to women's wellness who were put on their um, birth, uh, put on their uh, antidepressant by their doctors um, and gone into having um, hypomania. So um, I think we're becoming more conservative again with the antidepressants <coughs> and who's, who's prescribing and when they're being given. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting that just came out this year is that women with premenstrual dysphoric disorder may also have um, abnormality, abnormalities in calcium metabolism. And this is, uh, this is, again, an interesting way that science goes. Specifically, this researcher, Thais Jacobs, was the person that um, you had this theory, and their first studies did not show any differences in calcium levels in women with premenstrual dysphoric disorder um, back about five years ago. But they did a study, um, a very well done, two large studies of calcium supplementation, 1,200 milligrams, and found that it placebo controlled that it improved symptoms. And then this year, um, they've done a study again and found that, yes, this group of women did show. So you can imagine in doing studies, you need a very large number of women. And um, it, that's one thing that's hard because it's not that common a disorder. So this is a story that will follow. But we definitely recommend calcium because it's good for people in general anyway. And I would say in my clinical practice, I've probably tend to, we, we tend to get people that have, you know, had really a hard time, failed different treatments. So, but if people who are treatment naive, I'd say about 10% really feel better with exercise and calcium and we don't need to go further. So definitely would recommend that. To go on now to major depression and pregnancy, um, which is another lifestyle stage for women in affective disorders. Um, when I trained, it was really believed that 
pregnancy was a protective time for mood disorders and people would people really did teach us that we could expect that our patients would feel better because of all that estrogen and that fulfillment that would come with, with, the, with the pregnancy. But we've now found that the prevalence um, is, is really no different in depression than in a non-pregnant state. And there was a very interesting study published just this month from Kaiser um, that looked at 5,000 women in their, in their database and um, looked at rates of depression um, in the group and found that it was about 10 percent. So it ranges from 7 to 15 percent, similar to the prevalence rate when not depressed. So what then does that bode for somebody who is, um, has a history of depression, has been <laughs> treated for their depression, and now comes to Women's Wellness Clinic or any clinic around the country and wants to know what to do about taking medication and what is the risk of going off the medication. And this is a study that attracted a lot of attention uh, last summer, or two summers ago, um, done at MGH. And it, it's hard for, I imagine you, and it's very hard for me to believe that this is the only study of its kind in which people who were um, going into their pregnancies were followed prospectively. I mean, that's kind of, shocking, isn't it? Um, so it took these women and a um, total um, of 115 women and looked at what happened if they stayed on their antidepressant, went off their antidepressant, or changed the dosages of their antidepressant. And the, the criteria for um, entry had to be that they were currently not depressed. And um, so what happened, as you can see from the slide, is that um, of the people who um, discontinued their antidepressant, only 30% did not relapse, or 70% did relapse, versus the 70% who did, or, excuse me, the 75% or so, 74% who did not discontinue it. So this created a tremendous amount of um, attention and promotion in some ways of staying on one's antidepressant. The one thing I would want to point out is the importance of really looking carefully at studies. This group of women were, when the um, mean age was in the early 30s, but they had had three or more episodes of major depression. Um, so this, this group of women had had, um, you know, pretty severe depressions too. And so I think while the study is important and we do counsel women that we do not expect their depression to get better during pregnancy, we do look very individually at each person's history um, because I think this is not a completely generalizable study, um, but it's the only one of its kind. So in terms of sitting with people and trying to think about weighing the risks and benefits of taking medication during <coughs> pregnancy, we have to think about um, the risks and the benefits, um, and specifically the benefit being that depression itself is risky. And so we think about um, the teratogenesis being to the, the body itself of the baby, to the behavior later of the baby, neurodevelopment, um, then complications at delivery, um, and as well as the potential for miscarriage. And then as you can imagine, that there's also problems with not treating in pregnancy. Um, these problems are not as clearly defined as we would like. You need to have um, people of similar um, health uh, health behaviors followed with similar risk factors. And so you can imagine how hard it is to clarify the contribution of depression to later um, premature labor, et cetera. But several studies suggest that, there, that depression itself may be associated with prematurity um, and low birth weight. And clearly it's associated severe depression with poor self-care in the mom. So one of the big controversies that came out this year was whether anti or a couple two years ago was, was whether antidepressants themselves are associated with miscarriage. And again, it's so amazing to be in the field and see things shift from one side to the other. So when this study came out, it was a meta-analysis of all of the um, studies. Um, it suggested a slightly increased risk um, in women who were taking antidepressants. The important point here is that the studies did not control for reproductive history of the women. And that is the most important contribution to risk for miscarriage. If a woman has a history of 
miscarriage, she has a much greater risk for having a second miscarriage. And if you've had several miscarriages, it's like 50% compared to somebody who has never had a miscarriage. <coughs> so um, we counsel people that if you've never had a miscarriage and you need the medication, that the risk of not taking it is probably greater than the risk of taking it in terms of miscarriage. So um, this is, did everybody, are people familiar with this whole question of antidepressants and congenital malformations? <coughs> that, that tremendous um, concern this year. I yeah. To get back to when you were saying it's not to just take antidepressants when you're bipolar, right? Mm -hmm. How about people that are polar? Polar? Unipolar? Yeah. Um, you mean major depression, only unipolar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important to think. But in pregnancy, we have to go very carefully evaluate the risks versus the benefits. Um, when <coughs> we were in, luckily for us, our, ourselves and our patients in Women's Wellness Clinic, um, we have always been really conservative, and the, and the legacy of Dr. Casper is psychotherapy with medications. And so, um, specifically, for about 10 years, the concept was that these medications were safe because it was not showing up of congenital malformations. But then, in 2005, um, the registry um, looked at, for Glasgow Welcome, looked back and found they were asked to do um, an evaluation of. Um, the safety because there was some concern that Wellbutrin might be associated with malformations, but what they found out was that it was actually paroxetine, which seemed to have an increased risk of heart defects. And so um, that uh, risk is, is almost um, odds ratio of, of almost two. And um, the particular defect that has been pretty consistently now shown with perox paroxetine is um, what we call a ventricular septal defect. And it's the most common heart defect um, in people not exposed to any known medication. Um, it's estimated to occur in about 1% of the general population. The good news is that most of these are very small defects, and most of them do close on their own. Um, so when you read in the paper that paroxetine is associated with congenital de defects, I think it's important to put in perspective which ones and how serious. Clearly, you don't want this to, to, to be going on with your baby because some of them do require surgery, but um, this is the particular defect that it's been associated with. Um, so just because we're running out of time to let you know that to follow the story, you've, we started with a signal and a registry, and now there's been three major studies that have been um, conducted in the last um, two years that have looked at large birth registries to see if this has um, has been replicated, and, and again, Paxil has continued to be shown to be associated. But the good news is that, is that um, as a general class of, of antidepressants, the SSRIs um, have not been other than the Paxil. So I'll move quickly through this. How did about, you, yeah? Sorry, what, what did you just say? Oh. Did you just say that Paxil was shown not to cause? No, Paxil has been showing, shown to yes, cause. but the others have not. And it's, a, it's still not a high risk, but it is the one antidepressant that we definitely don't prescribe now in pregnancy. Yeah. One of the things, though, that people will ask, and this that slide was saying about teratogenicity, is what is the um, known effect on the developing brain? And unfortunately, while now we have a large amount of um, registry information about congenital malformations and teratogenicity, we don't have much information about um, neurodevelopmental follow-up. And this is actually all that we have, which is about 200 children followed over time. And so that is a real area that women's health needs to focus on, our follow-up studies. And you can imagine how difficult it would be because you would need to control for the intelligence of the parents, the education opportunities. I mean, these are hard studies to do. But it is something that is, um, really needs to be done. So to move on to um, the perinatal complications associated with antidepressants, um, I don't know if you guys have seen in, in the paper this worry that the antidepressants um, are associated with what we call neonatal adaptation, that babies exposed in the last um, trimester 
have problems with um, jitteriness, poor feeding, temperature dysregulation. And um, again, this is something that has only in the last five years come to our attention as people have been following these babies. And um, one of the things that we're interested in Women's Wellness Clinic is, is uh, what about children who are premature? Because um, one could expect that if, the, if these are problems in full-term infants, that the, the premature babies would be even more at risk. And if indeed depression and antidepressants may be associated, and I'm not saying they are at all, but if they are um, with prematurity, then we're going to have a bigger problem. And so this is the only study so far that has looked at premature infants. All the other studies have not um, included them in their databases. And what they found was is that the preemies um, were um, definitely um, had more uh, difficulty with this uh, adaptation syndrome with longer hospital stays. And so what we're doing now is a study um, that we got a feasibility award through Packard Hospital to work with the neonatal um, intensive care unit with their premature babies and um, look at babies that have been exposed to SSRIs in utero and see what exactly are the outcome measures specifically, days on, on respirator, temperature, um, and other um, physiologic parameters because the other studies have only reported 20% admitted to a NICU special care unit but without any definitive um, clarification of what are the symptoms. So that is what we're doing right now. Um, it's a small feasibility study. And um, we're also looking to see what is the, the prevalence of major depression in this population of women, which we just don't know. Um, and um, to see uh, also about other complications that may be occurring in this population. So untreated major depression in pregnancy is also associated with risks though, as I described before. And um, some of these adverse events include prematurity and the most important clear definitive one is the risk for postpartum depression, not most important, but the one that we know for sure that um, depression during pregnancy is a strong predictor for depression postpartum. And um, to move on to postpartum mood disorders, we define um, the mood disorders as the blues, depression, and the postpartum psychosis. The blues are very common. Um, up to 85% of women will experience mood dysregulation in the two weeks after having a baby with crying and sleep disturbance, independent of the baby. Um, and the treatment for that is support and reassurance. What's, what's important is, is that 25% of these people will then go on to have postpartum depression. And um, then very rare um, is postpartum psychosis. Um, postpartum depression, it has basically the exact um, same definition as major depression, which I covered at the beginning of the talk. Um, the increased risk is in anyone with a past mood disorder, a past postpartum disorder, and then as I said, depression or anxiety during pregnancy. Uh, also obstetrical problems um, is a predictor as well as a poor social support system. And um, one of the things that's been really fascinating in working in the field of women's health is what we call phenotypic differences, specifically the way an illness presents itself. And there's been a lot of discussion of whether postpartum depression is a distinct entity from major depression in general. And um, what we do see is that um, postpartum depression does seem to cluster very strongly in families. Um, and um, it is a, a, a problem in women who have had mood episodes, for instance, with premenstrual syndrome or with the birth control pill. And um, the other piece is, is very associated with high anxiety. This was an interesting study looking at the effects of um, hormones on women with postpartum history of depression. And the, the point of the, of the slide is, is that the women who had no history of postpartum depression were not affected by the hormone withdrawal. They manipulated um, the, the women by putting them on something that stopped the menstrual cycle, then added back estrogen, added back progesterone, and then took the, both hormones away. And the women who had a history of postpartum depression had mood symptoms, whereas the women that did not, did not have as many mood symptoms. 
So um, the treatments include antidepressants, as you I'm sure know. Psychological interventions are very important. Um, different forms of psychotherapy, such as interpersonal psychotherapy, which is focuses on the people in your life, the relationships in your life, and how to make those better, as well as cognitive therapy. And um, I just wanted to tell you about a small study we did here at the Women's Wellness Clinic, where we looked at women who had presented to the clinic with the new onset of depression and had never been, not been treated in the clinic, and looked at um, the anxiety, because this is something that we're really interested in. 81% had clinically significant anxiety, yet only 10% had ever been treated or, or actually um, experienced that, that level of anxiety before. What's important, too, is that the mean time to the presentation to the clinic in an area like this, which has a highly educated population, both physicians and the people themselves, was almost four months. So this again speaks to what you read about, that, that postpartum depression goes untreated for long periods of time, unfortunately. We then looked at um, the CGI is the Clinical Global Impression Inventory, which is a clinical rating of how severe the illness is. And it goes from one to six, six being very severe with active suicidality and psychosis. And we and What's important is to note that the people that came in were really suffering. The mean um, CGI was 4.7. 30% of the people had active suicidal ideation. But what's very positive is to see that um, almost 70% had full remission um, with treatment. And um, only less than 10% did not have remission, but they did, most of them had response. So while you will read about scary things in the paper, like Andrea Yates, the good take-home message is postpartum depression is very treatable. And the important point here, too, is, this is these are people that only had one medication trial in general. We did not have to get into multiple medications to augment, you know, which we frequently do for, for other forms of depression. So I know we need to wrap up. Um, early detection is important. Prevention. Um, Studies have shown that psychoeducation can um, really help with um, postpartum depression, as well as individual psychotherapy, and then prophylactic antidepressant in people who have a history of postpartum depression. If a woman comes in and says, I've had this before, we do recommend starting antidepressants um, postpartum. And um, bipolar women are at particular high risk for the uh, recurrence of a mood episode postpartum. Um, much higher risk than women with unipolar major depression. And um, we really have to watch women with this um, diagnosis very, very carefully. And this is a group of people that we always recommend um, prophylactic, anti, um, uh, prophylactic mood stabilizers in the postpartum period. Um, we also emphasize the importance of sleep because, as many of you may know, sleep is a big trigger for a manic episode, and you can imagine that this is really difficult for women that have a baby. Um, so we bring in the partner, and we really emphasize the need for someone to help with uh, sleep hygiene during this period of time, especially the six weeks. That seems to be the critical window. Um, and just to move on, um, the bottom line is, is we, we, we counsel that there's no long-term follow-up data on antidepressant safety um, for the developing child. But the good news is, is that several of the antidepressants, such as sertraline, have not been shown to be found in the infant's blood at substantial levels. So we feel relatively comfortable with, for instance, sertraline in nursing if a woman really wants to nurse. And then I put this slide in to emphasize that while I've talked a lot about medications, you know, it's the, the total person and their total life with other people that are crucial. And that's really important because at Women's Wellness, we frequently see um, referrals from the community for treatment refractory problems. And one of the important points that I always teach the residents is, is that marital conflict has been the one predictor of treatment resistant postpartum depression. It's a very important component and you really need to understand what else is going on in a person's life if they're not getting better. And to move on, um, I know we're almost on time. Should I just keep moving on? Okay. One of the areas that I've been really interested in in working in women's wellness and here at the hospital is um, infertility related mood issues. It's something that's very much overlooked, um, I think, and um, yet 20 5 to 50% of women who are currently undergoing infertility treatment 
actually suffer the diagnosis of major depression. This has been shown in many, many studies. Um, Furthermore, um, women tend to be more distressed and um, affected than their male partners, which then leads to, as I just said, persistence of problems in the, in the, in the um, dyad. What's also interesting is whether the infertility medications themselves contribute to these <coughs> symptoms of depression. And the ways they could do that is, um, for instance, gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists are medications that women take to stop ovulation. And so they take that at the beginning of the fertility cycle so that they will not be creating their own ovulation because then they're going to take medications that will then create ovulation. And um, those medications make you go into a, a, a menopausal state. They lower the estrogen level. And those can certainly be associated with hot flashes as well as sleep disturbance, irritability, and um, memory problems. Then clomiphene, clomiphene citrate is a medication that women take to um, lead to multiple follicles in their ovaries. It's a medication that works on the hypothalamus to lead to increased um, FSH and LH pulses, which then create multiple follicles. And we have found that this medication can also be associated with mood changes in some women. Um, furthermore, um, progesterone has been well documented to be associated with fatigue and for some women, depression. And then finally, um, the recombinant um, FSH, which women inject in order to get super ovulation with the you know, 20 and 30 follicles, um, can raise your estrogen levels very high at mid-cycle, and then they come down quickly if you don't get pregnant. And so you can imagine you have this, this sort of theoretical postpartum state which we could theorize some people would be particularly sensitive to. And we do see this in Women's Wellness Clinic. It's hard to do a good study with this because people are so busy. This is not a population that really is interested in. <laughs> and it's also coming over and doing all our psychometrics, but we see it clinically. Um, and so women who may be at risk for this would be women with a history of sensitivity to changes in hormones. So women who have a, come in and say, look, I have the worst PMS in the world. What do you think it's going to be like when I go through infertility treatment? We say, you know, we, we don't have large studies to prove this, but we do think you would be more at risk than someone else. Similarly, women who with bipolar disorder. So just to finish up with the last sort of stage of hormonal um, changes in the women's life cycle is, is perimenopause. And I put this slide in because it just reminds us that um, menopause is not a, a one state you know, event. It's a transition. And the transition often begins with menstrual irregularities. And then there can be symptoms um, that are sort of neurocognitive, like mood swings, loss of concentration. And then the, the later symptoms are signs of clear estrogen deficiency, such as um, uh, bladder symptoms, vaginal discomfort, osteoporosis. Um, I made this slide because when I started at Women's Wellness Clinic, in one week, three people from the help center came in and said, I don't know if it's mood or menopause. And I just, you know, because we just didn't have a lot of literature at the time, I thought that was such a great question because the overlap is very significant clinically. Um, the things that are different, obviously, are in a mood disorder, you would not expect to have hot flashes, and you would not expect to have the urogenital symptoms or obviously the osteoporosis. But you can see that in the middle, you see a lot of overlap with memory problems, that's Dr. Stefanik's <laughs> expertise, um, loss of libido, energy loss, weight changes, sleep problems, and mood swings. So. Um, the perimenopause um, is the stage when a woman's cycles are becoming irregular, and then the, the menopause is after the one year after the last menstrual cycle. And so there's been a lot of, of controversy of what, what causes the, um, the memory and the uh, sleep disturbance and the, and the mood problems. And um, it's important to note that some studies have not controlled for the frequency of hot flashes and insomnia in mood evaluation. But what's, so for about five years people were saying, well really there's no increased risk of mood disorders in the perimenopause because it can all be, um, it can all be explained by the sleep problem which is an estrogen, underlying estrogen problem. But 
in the last three years, there's been some very well done studies. Um, one of them is the Massachusetts um, mood and menstrual cycle studies that have looked at um, women prospectively going through the perimenopause and they have controlled for those variables and they have found that perimenopause is a time of high risk for the onset of mood disorder. Um, onset in women with no previous history of major depression and recurrence in women who have had depression. Um, so the previous history of, of major depression can also be associated in possibly with an earlier menopause. I'm not going to say this is definitive. Some people that give talks think this is sort of the end of the story. I think we really need to follow this more. But there is some suggestion that women who have had frequent um, depressions are having earlier menopause. Um, and also um, that this earlier start of menopause and a longer, per excuse me, earlier perimenopause onset and a longer period of perimenopause is clearly though associated with more depression. And um, premenstrual syndrome has been associated, premenstrual dysphoric disorder with perimenopausal mood disorders. So what do we do about perimenopausal depression? Well, in 2007, we do not start with estrogen. Um, that was one of the major questions, you know, in 1995 when those women were coming in. We do start with antidepressants for clear major depressive episode. Um, there have been really no comparative trials of antidepressants in this population of women, so we can't say this one is better than that one. Um, so far, all look pretty efficacious. Um, sometimes if people are having hot flashes, we have a little more data on the mixed norepinephrine serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Effexor and Cymbalta for um, hot flashes and depression. So frequently if someone's really suffering hot flashes, we'll start with that. In terms of estrogen, there have been several studies that suggest that adding on estrogen in treatment uh, refractory cases can lead to remission. Uh, Dr. Raskin has done a lot of work in this area when she was at UCLA. Um, I, many of these studies are rather small, um, so we don't start with estrogen, but we certainly hold it out as, as a potential augmenter for antidepressants. And um, just to end with hot flashes, I mean, I think they're, they're a ubiquitous problem, and many people suffer them and don't have tremendous emotional reaction to them. I think we need to be really sensitive to people that do and understand that they can be incredibly disruptive and, and dis distressing, especially for the population that's had a history of panic attacks because a hot flash can feel like a panic attack because there will be a heart rate elevation um, and feelings frequently of, of, of um, distress and even doom the way you can have with a panic attack. Um, people with other anxiety disorders also appear to be more distressed by the hot flashes. And then there's been some interesting work about how one perceives their hot flash, similar to how does one perceive a panic attack. And if people have catastrophic cognitions, oh my goodness, they're never going to end. This means I'm really getting old. I'm really going to be sick from this. They'll get more, more frequent and more intense. So there's actually been some work on cognitive behavioral therapy. It doesn't take them away the way estrogen does, but it can improve them. And so the non-hormonal treatments include the antidepressants that I just talked about. Another medication that's not an antidepressant that was actually originally a um, mood stabilizer, or excuse me, was originally an anti-epileptic, gabapentin, and is now used in a psychiatry for anxiety disorders because it works on the GABAergic system, um, has been shown to be effective in hot flashes in about 60 to 70 percent of women. And we tend to start with gabapentin in our population um, because it's very useful for sleep if a person does not have depression. Um, clonidine. So I just wanted to end by saying that um, you know, mood disorders do affect us throughout the whole life cycle and it's um, something that has very, been very exciting to work in for the last 15 years to see the studies go from <laughs> non-placebo controlled studies to placebo controlled prospective studies and I think that we have a long way to go on all the areas that I just hit upon. Um, so we have this center now, the Women's Wellness Clinic is part of a center called the Center for Neuroscience and Women's Health. Dr. Raskin, who is going to be here tonight, um, is the director of the center and is the lead investigator in multiple studies um, looking at 
the effects of estrogen on cognition and um, looking at the effects of mood stabilizers on reproductive function in women. And um, we're not recruiting for any studies tonight because we're full with them, but we'll have more in the future and we'll let you know about them. So thank you very much. You know, in our clinic, we kind of end at about 55 because we have the geriatric psychiatry. So that, that is not an area of specialization for women's wellness clinic. Um, in terms of um, differences in, in depression, one of the things um, that has been shown is that the rates are pretty similar when people are past 55 and 60. I can't comment on phenotypic differences. Yes? Um, I would imagine that one of the risks for postpartum depression uh, might be professional difficulties anticipated by the woman. You know, because I know that women have to return very soon to work. So I've been wondering, um, you know, have there been cases where, um, you know, you might uh, prescribe a, um, I don't know, um, illness leave or something like that? And what was the response of the employers? I mean, do you consider there to be a pressure by employers to, you know, um, women on the job no matter what. Yeah, it's a big problem. Um, so in answer to your question, if a person is severely depressed, then they would, they would um, be eligible for disability because of the major depression. Yeah, but, or even sick leave, but yeah, I, I wasn't thinking of disability, but that's an interesting Yeah, there, there is, um, <coughs> there is the concern that if a person could have that taken out of their stress level, would their depression be better, yet they don't fulfill criteria for disability. So your, your point is well taken, that, that we find that, that stress and demands definitely can exacerbate or lead to the lack of remission from depression. And um, there is a a fantasy that if your patient didn't have to go back to work, you know, things would go better, but we're not allowed to, you know, write the note for that unless someone's very sick. And are but, they allowed to take sick leave? Um, they can take, it's, it depends on different um, employers, so it's, it's variable from place to place. Um, some places you, you, know, you use up your sick days and that's it. So that the, and then you're in trouble, whereas that's different than disability. Um, does that answer your so question? So are they, are they the, I mean, you know, because I would think when you're a new mother and when then you have to face the pressures of your job, um, you know, I mean, the demands might be just too much for, a, you know, a person, no matter what medications you're taking. So, No, you it's know, true. I mean, are there any protections, medical protections for women in, in that? Well, or, it, or do they risk getting fired? Yeah, you know, they do. They do. I mean, specifically, if a person is in the throes of a major depressive episode in which the physician feels they cannot work, then they're protected. But if they are um, in partial remission and uh, and their employer says you need to be back, they really have to go back. It's, it's a big problem how six weeks, you know, is, is not a very long time. No. It's a big problem. Yeah. <clears throat> Perimenopause question. Uh -huh. uh, depression can be a result from hypothyroidism. And is there a relation between perimenopause and hypothyroidism because of the hormone changes? Um, I'm not. I'm not certain about the hormonal changes as being the primary cause, but the onset of autoimmune causes for hypothyroidism do increase in the middle years, and that's when many women present with, for instance, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So yes, yeah. Are there simple and effective uh, screening tools that you can use um, mid to late pregnancy and early postpartum that can be implemented? Yes. Well, specifically, there is not a good um, pregnancy tool. And when I was showing you Cohen's data from MGH, that was another concern I had with the study. 
So the tool they used was what's called a Hamilton Depression Scale. And that is a scale that's an observer rating scale. So I'm looking at you and deciding. <coughs> and when you look at that, um, that is heavily weighted to physical symptoms. So on that scale, you could there's three questions, for instance, on sleep. Well, anybody who's been pregnant knows sleep's a big problem. There's one question on libido. Anyone who's been pregnant knows that's probably going to be different. Um, similarly with appetite and energy. So um, in answer to your question, I would not use that scale. Um, the Beck Depression, in, so that's one of the major skills we use in depression research, and then the Beck Depression Inventory, which is a subjective measure. And that one is more weighted towards cognitions. So questions like, I feel very bad about myself. Um, I feel like I'm a failure. I don't look forward to anything in the future. I would use that one um, in answer to your question about postpartum. But there's been no formal pregnancy scale yet developed and validated. Postpartum, the Edinburgh Depression Inventory is widely used and considered very, very reliable and valid. And um, uh, can, can it be used as a pretty good predictor in pregnancy? The EDI, the Edinburgh? Yeah. The, I've, I think that it's, uh, well, it's, it's focused on postpartum, so it's not a very good one during pregnancy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, um, yeah, no, um, that is a, a very um, complicated question. So, um, yes, the, uh, to comment on stress and fertility. So, <laughs> the reason I'm hesitating is we wrote a paper that um, is in the human reproduction update last month that <laughs> is the longest longest effort I ever put into a paper because of how complicated that is, <laughs> the topic is. Um, there's clear theoretical reasons why stress would, would be associated with fertility because um, it's clearly shown that stress can be associated with increased cortisol and that um, that can then be associated with the luteinizing hormone and FSH pulses and changes in the menstrual cycle. And so we all have heard about people who, you know, had a horrible, horrible loss or terrible stress who stopped getting their period. So that's, you know, that's like a very obvious outcome measure. You stop getting your period, you're not going to get pregnant. But what about people who seem to have their period and seem to be fertile but aren't getting pregnant? And so um, that's a lot harder to measure. And they have done some um, work, small studies, where they bring women in and they look at the pulse frequency of LH and FSH and then do measures of anxiety and depression. And they have shown that, that there may be an abnormality in, in the way these pulses are, um, the, sort of the cyclicity of them. Not, but there's not a difference in the absolute estrogen levels and frequently there's, there, these people are ovulating. so. We don't, we don't really know, but, but there, there is a belief that it is associated. One of the really interesting models for this is something called hypothalamic amenorrhea, which are women who um, do not um, have regular menstrual cycles. And um, a woman named Sally Burga did some very interesting work with this group of people because she noticed that this group was very much like anorexia nervosa patients with high perfectionism and um, very, um, uh, how would I say, not extraordinarily flexible um, and, and quickly self-critical. And so she thought, gosh, this is really interesting that the personality profile would be so similar. Um, and she did cognitive behavioral therapy um, to try to help them. And interestingly, um, periods came back in, I think it was over half. Um, and so, again, this speaks to the, the internal stress, one's own models of oneself um, having an effect, as well as external stress. So there's clearly something there. Um, 
But you know, some people with extraordinary stress are extraordinarily fertile. So, you know, it's, it's just such a complex topic, you know. But in answer to your question, um, Alice Domar, who you guys may have seen, she's done a lot of work um, at, she started at Mass General, now she has her own institute. And she started the mind-body stress reduction groups at Harvard. And um, it was a little concerning because they were promoting these as, as helping people get pregnant. Um, but, you know, you have to be clear what are the ideologies of the low fertility, you know, were, did they all have the same, you know, FSH level and all of that. And those things have not been controlled for in these studies. And um, what is important, though, is that it's been shown multiple times that these groups help with anxiety and depression. I can't say they lead to a pregnancy, but they do help mood. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.